We've got some really problematic policing, and we've got protests, and we've got riots with looting and worse. These things are distinct, but they are certainly wrapped up with one another somehow. And America has been here before, in the long, hot summers of the late 1960s. Can we learn something by looking back? So um, for a look at the lessons to be learned from the long, hot summers of the late 1960s, we have as our guest today, Dr. Jonathan Bean. Uh, welcome, Dr. Bean. Glad to be here, Graham. So glad you're here with us. Um, uh, so I've got some questions for you, uh, and I know our participants on the call will be speaking up with their own questions in just a few minutes. But let me first uh, let everybody know a little bit about uh, Dr. Jonathan Bean. Uh, Dr. Bean is a research fellow here uh, with the Independent Institute, but he's also a professor of history uh, in his full-time job at Southern Illinois University. Uh, which is obviously in Southern Illinois. And um, he's also been a member of the Illinois State Advisory Pancel, Panel for the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and has testified before the U.S. Senate on a variety of issues. Um, you have had uh, interviews, articles, and so forth in a bunch of interesting places, including NPR, Fox News, CBS, U.S. News and World Report, Newsweek, Mother Jones, and Salon. You sound like you're kind of a bipartisan, multidimensional guy. Well, some of the work that I've done on uh, government contracting, for example, the corruption in it, um, is of interest to people on the left, the right, and the middle. And of course, the work that I've done with the Independent Institute, particularly my book, Race and Liberty in America. Hey, I'm glad you mentioned that because I happen to have a copy of this book, Race and Liberty in America, uh, which is all about uh, the uh, long history of, in fact, uh, the ways in which uh, our history is full of principles that bear on the subject that require reaffirming our American heritage rather than getting away from it. So um, anyway, take a look at Professor Jonathan Bean's book, Race and Liberty in America. It's on Amazon, also independent.org. You can get it there. So um, yeah, so let's get into this. Um, so is it okay if I call you John rather than Dr. Bean? That's fine, Graham. Okay, great, great. Um, thank you. Uh, so looking at history, um, you know, we've got, uh, in retrospect, um, some experience with these kind of troubles before, as I alluded to at the top. Uh, we've had uh, long, hot summers before, uh, back in the late 1960s. Um, how were the turbulent times back then similar to what we've got going now? Well, in some ways, it's a vintage replay of the 1960s, but with some different context, of course. Uh, when we talk about the long, hot summers of the 1960s, um, the, the first riots occurred in 1964 in uh, Rochester, New York, and Harlem. They didn't get a great deal of national attention. Uh, what really made riots a national issue and, and involved a great deal of soul searching uh, was kicked off with the Watts riot in Los Angeles in 1965. Mm -hmm. That was the first riot that was televised. And so from the summer of 65 to the summer of 68, when there was the last great wave of riots after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, um, right. you had three over 300 riots in hundreds of U.S. cities. And in, a, in an article separate from my book, Race and Liberty in America, uh, entitled Burn Baby Burn, Small Business in the Urban Riots of the 1960s, yeah, and of course, you have to remind some of our, our participants who maybe were not around back then of uh, what that phrase, burn, baby, burn, meant at the time. In, in the summer of 65, when the L.A. riot broke out, the chant, burn, baby, burn, was actually uh, a, a, a music DJ. Uh, it, had, it didn't really have a riot or looting context. Oh. Uh, like burn, baby, burn. Uh, something you might hear later in the 1970s in disco. Yeah, uh, right. But, of course, the rioters and the looters would chant such things like burn, baby, burn. Because um, and, okay. the riots also involved a great deal of arson and a great destruction of small businesses. Which Just as a reminder, as a reminder historically, um, when was the uh, murder of Martin Luther King Jr.? April 1968. Yeah, so in other words, this rioting period began not as a result of uh, his assassination, but for other reasons. Yes, I mean, one difference is that the riots of the 1960s stunned America because we seem to have reached a triumph of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, 
Um, in the summer of 65, uh, President Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act. And then just five days later, Watts in Los Angeles explodes. Right. And so the liberal response <clears throat> was that we didn't realize the situation was this bad. And they, they somewhat conflated protests with riots, which we're seeing again now. Mm -hmm. uh, the conservative response, which took a while to gain traction, was a law and order response. We've heard that voiced by President Trump. Uh, yeah. Richard Nixon would ride law and order to victory in 1968. Uh, I don't think it will work out in Donald Trump's favor uh, this time uh, because we're in an early uh, response to riots. So uh, the last time we had a major riot was in LA, the Rodney King riot of 1992, and President Bush's approval rating plummeted. And of course he lost the election. Right, right. Now, uh, you recently um, penned this really interesting commentary, which was published in Fox News, I think, about a week ago, week and a half ago. Uh, the title that you used was Riots After Floyd Death, similar to 1960 riots. The liberal response repeats mistakes of the past. So talk a little bit about the mistakes of the past uh, during that period in the late 60s. What was the liberal response that was mistaken? And so we kind of get a sense of what you mean by that. Well, of course, liberals of the 1960s were strong supporters of civil rights. Their response to the riots was ambivalent. Um, President Johnson would issue speeches that essentially said, you should not riot, but we understand why you did. And so there was sort of a built-in expectation, uh, a moral mm -hmm. innocence given to rioters and looters. Um, we haven't quite seen that as strongly voiced now, but the, the riots and the looting which are a source of injustice to the businesses that are destroyed, the live, you know, livelihoods and the jobs that are destroyed. Um, we're seeing that again now. I think one person who stands out today is uh, President Barack Obama, of all people, uh, because he, uh, in an in a essay, which he published a couple of weeks ago on Medium, the online journal Medium, uh, he unequivocally condemned the violence and said that protesters and their supporters need to uphold a higher ethical code. And so he urged people to channel protests and organizing into legitimate channels. We really didn't see that kind of uh, strongly support protests and activism and strongly condemn riots in the 1960s. And of course, Donald Trump has, has kind of fumbled with his response as well. Yeah, it's, it's unclear exactly where he's weighing in. Um, it's certainly interesting how uh, Barack Obama uh, made that very clear statement. It, it really sounds very different from, example, uh, for, from, for example, the instance you gave in the piece about how White House aide Harry McPherson, aide to President Johnson, uh, said, of course, we understand, you know, while you rioted, as if somehow uh, they were exculpating uh, the violence. Um, that was coming out of the White House at, the t at that time. We're not getting that out of this White House, but even Barack Obama is not saying that. I think we should be grateful. Yes. But on the other hand, we are seeing calls for more social spending. That was the liberal response in the 1960s. There mm -hmm. are calls for police reform, um, which certainly their police reform is merited, but uh, some who are calling for it are acting as nothing has changed in policing since the 1960s, which is patently untrue. Um, so there's a, there's a different political context, and we have to keep that in mind. What, do you, uh, what can you say about the extent of the rioting and damage then versus now? I mean, for instance, in your article, you mentioned that how in Detroit in 1967, there were, I think you said, 1,500 buildings were torched, 43 people killed, 342 injured. Uh, I have trouble assessing the comparative magnitude then versus now. Can you? Well, we don't have any data on the riots yet now, but the, the damage in, in the 1960s was... Uh, horrific. Over 10,000 businesses, at least, in Detroit, the worst riot, um, mm -hmm. 2,500 businesses. I show my students aerial footage of the Detroit riot, and it, it just looks like the city was bombed. And, and that wow. had a lasting impact on those uh, black neighborhoods and those mm -hmm. business districts. Um, it was very difficult for small businesses to start up again. When they did, they were boarded up because uh, there was the riots contributed to crime, uh, including destruction of uh, glass windows in stores. Uh, 
So it was very difficult to pe get people to work uh, in those business, business districts any longer. Um, mm -hmm. So it really scarred the cities of America for decades. Uh, some people uh, think that the decline of Detroit um, was primarily the result of the shift from a manufacturing economy to uh, you know, technology information economy. But I think that in addition to that, these riots couldn't have helped. No, they certainly didn't help. I mean, one, one uh, explanation in 1967 for the Detroit riot was that uh, the young black people that were looting, mainly for fun and profit, uh, didn't have access to good jobs. But in Detroit, it, it really wasn't true. You had, a, you had a liberal city government. The unemployment rate was 3.5%. 3.5%? Yeah, it was historically wow. low among blacks who had access to uh, uh, manufacturing jobs. Um, so we know the future of Detroit. But in 1967, people saw Detroit and Los Angeles, frankly, uh, the National Urban League, the Black Civil Rights Organization, uh, rated these cities very highly as, as some of the best places in America to live for blacks. Wow. Well, so back to the question of uh, not repeating mistakes. Um, this is like your most important point, I think. Uh, one mistake that you've clearly identified here is that typically white liberals uh, during that time, they conflated the protests with the riots, and that was a mistake. I think you're suggesting we not repeat that mistake. Um, talk about that and what other mistakes there were. Well, and that's a very difficult question, and a lot of people are trying to answer it. Um, they, the police had learned how to control riots, but to carry out riot control is, is there has to be the will there, and um, it's, it simply doesn't seem possible in our democracy once riots begin uh, to, to halt them. Um, but you can frame the response. Um, in, after 2015, <clears throat> President Barack Obama when the Baltimore riots occurred after the mm -hmm. Freddie Gray case, mm -hmm. you know, he called for calm and to let the investigation carry out and so forth. Um, so a good moral stance on the issue, distinguishing between protests and riots, uh, and a better response to, to aiding those small businesses that were destroyed. Uh, they were, that whole issue was ignored in the 1960s. And it's in danger of being lost now. Um, you know, people are recognized that businesses were destroyed, um, but they don't really put a face on it. So in the 1960s, small business owners asked Congress to write them a check, essentially, since they felt that the city, the state, the federal government invited uh, looters and rioters to um, destroy their businesses. What a thought. Yeah, and you, so they should, be reinsured, they should be reinsured for their uninsured losses. Now, that's not a particularly libertarian response, but, no, you know, but I do think it's morally justified. If the government abdicates its responsibility, um, that's, that's a proper solution. You used the term moral holiday looking back at some of the 1960s riots. What did that mean? What did you mean by that? Well, that's, that's tied in with the ambivalent response of liberal Democrats in the cities and in the Johnson administration, that um, they, they couldn't really condemn what was going on in a way that people in the streets got the message. Here's mm -hmm. how, I'll give you one example. Um, in the 1960s, because of this ambivalent liberal response, the police in American cities were told to stand down. If you read my article in the Independent Review on the riots, there are cases of small business owners going to their shops. The looters are carrying out everything. And there are police officers standing there, not arresting anyone. Now, they've taken to arresting people, which is a step in the right direction. Um, but essentially, you know, if you tell the police to stand down, uh, you're just going to perpetuate this cycle of rioting. So telling the police to stand down means that certain people in certain neighborhoods no longer enjoy the protection of the rule of law for their lives and property. Yes. Now, we have to admit that those communities in the 1960s and to a certain extent now um, have issues with the police. Um, Understandably. In the 1960s, the police forces in the cities were uniformly white. Mm. Um, that's simply not true now. And I think the charge of systemic racism uh, in policing uh, 
is unmerited. But things like uh, demilitarizing the police, that's certainly warranted. Um, finding ways to undo the criminalization of almost everything. And uh, a big step would be uh, decriminalizing drugs. Um, those would be steps in the right direction. So um, it does seem that things have quieted down a bit since last week around the country. Have I got that right or am I not reading the right media? <laughs> um, so far, yes. And so this is the question. In the 1960s, people expected each year that there would, that there would be uh, a riots. Uh, I've done research in the Johnson administration and um, in the papers, it was clear they expected in 65, they expected riots in 66. They expected them in 67 and 68. Um, however, maybe this year will be like 1992, the Rodney King riot in LA. It was, a, it was essentially a one-off in 1992. And there was a call for police reform, uh, but there was also a law and order response when, when Clinton took office and there was much more funding of the police. So um, it could be like 1992 or it could be like the 1960s. So here's a, here's a question. Since we're doing historical comparisons, John, uh, one of our friends says, uh, BLM has been compared to the Black Panthers. Do you agree with this? And how do they differ? You're a historian. Can you tell us? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, it is a really um, good one. <laughs> Tough. <laughs> that's a question that could get me in trouble um, since I'm still teaching on a college campus. You can say no comment if you have to, but uh, no, we are no, curious. No, I, I'm, <laughs> not, I'm not one to dodge questions. Okay, so the Black Panthers, they had a side that appealed to at least white liberals and some others, um, you know, having uh, free lunch programs and the like in Oakland, uh, community organizing in Chicago. Um, of course, they were, they were armed uh, and, and they, uh, they uh, had incidents with the police. Uh, they saw themselves as armed uh, self-defense of the black community. Uh, B BLM, you know, it has, the, it has the side that faces mainstream America, which is Black Lives Matter. I have many friends of, across the spectrum that they too, they, they embrace that. They're black, they're white, they're Asian. Well, which you mean they embrace the slogan or they embrace, they embrace, the, embrace, embrace the slogan? Because there's an organization as well there's as... There's an organization. Okay, yeah, so that's, like, that's the difference. We, so, which are you endorsing? When you, say, when you say Black Lives Matter, are you endorsing the slogan or are you endorsing the organization? That's the question. Well, the, the organization, like the Black Panthers, is, is troublesome. Um, the listeners, if they're interested in the, in the Black Panthers in Oakland, California, at least, uh, there was a uh, book that won a National Book Award, I think, um, by Hugh Pearson called Shadow of the Panther. And it's a study of the Black Panther organization in Oakland. And he, is, he essentially shows, he wrote this 25 years after the Panthers were defunct, um, he shows that it was a black mafia. Uh, that they were shaking down black business owners as well as white oh. business owners. Um, it was it was really uh, wow criminally oriented. So there's a there's a there's a positive front, and then there's what's going on. Now, I'm not going to say that BLM is a black mafia, um, but if you look at some of their positions, they're much more extreme than people on Facebook who are echoing the Black Lives Matter slogan. Mm -hmm. Uh, would have you believe. I suspect that a lot of people who want to affirm the slogan really have no idea about the multi-point position uh, of the Black Lives Matter organization, which far exceeds um, issues of um, immediately racial justice and extends to a whole bunch of other things that uh, the sloganeers may or may not even be aware that there's that list of positions when they use the, the simple slogan. And of course, you never know what people mean when they use words. They sometimes mean more, sometimes they mean less. It's a complicated period. Okay, so I've got uh, a question from a friend of mine in Oklahoma. I am going to open up your um, microphone and let you talk. Okay, well, I, my it's not exactly a question. Uh, I, I, all anybody needs to do is read the website of Black Lives Matter. They... Uh, want to go away from the nuclear family. They call it Western, Western civilization. They want to do away with all private schools. 
They want no law enforcement whatsoever on in high schools or on college campuses. Uh, I think if people knew the radicalness of their platform, that they would have second thoughts. I entirely agree with what she said. Um, yeah. And people need to inform themselves. There's a great deal of virtual, virtue signaling going on right now um, where you know, people want to take the right stance. And it's difficult to, to debate BLM because it, it, it's been presented and packaged in such a, a nice or legitimate way. Uh, but the the caller is right. I mean, they are uh, opposed. They're quite quite hostile to law enforcement. Some of their affiliated groups, uh, they, they they instruct people don't call the police if you have a problem. Um, I mean, I just, I just think that's wrong. Charles Barkley, the uh, former NBA player, um, he's spoken out against this. He says ideas like defunding the police or hostility to law enforcement is the worst thing that could happen for black people in high crime mm. neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that getting rid of the historic uh, family structure of husband, wife, and children is going to benefit anybody. Uh, but again, as I say, not everybody who voices the slogan is aware of the facts uh, which our caller just presented. So regarding the funding the police, uh, we've got a question here in our chat section here. Uh, the one, here's one of our participants says, the one message that seems to have risen to the top is defund the police. And government in some places is taking this seriously. Does that it does seem that now the policy push is more invasive. Compare that to the 1960s. I don't think they were defunding the police then or calling for it, or were they? No, um, they weren't defunding the police. The, the situation with police is different now than then. Um, you, you have a call to defund the police now. Frankly, I don't think that's going to go anywhere, um, even <clears throat> under a Democratic administration. But uh, some differences. So. Most of the riots in the 1960s were triggered by incidents with the police. It was very rarely a shooting or a killing. It was other more mundane traffic stops, uh, an illegal after hours bar in Detroit. Um, and the police then were much more of an occupying force in a sense that they were all white and the neighborhoods that were all black. Um, today that's changed considerably. You have black mayors, black police chiefs, um, and in some cities, you know, uh, white cops are a minority. Um, they didn't have any police unions in the 1960s when policing was really much more um, hostile to minorities than now. Uh, we have police unions now. Another reform that's being called now is to uh, restrict uh, or abolish police unions. Um, I'm not sure that we'll really get to the uh, root problem here. Um, it may solve some of the, you know, secondary policy and protocol issues. Uh, some of the, uh, I understand some of the city police departments, they can't um, hold on to the record of accusations of wrongdoing by policemen because the, the union contracts restrict what can be retained on their records. And so sometimes people get transferred and transferred. And, and they can never, nobody can, the hiring agency can't look back and find out their record. of. That is true. It's very difficult um, to bring accountability. That's true with most public sector unions. It's true yeah, with teacher unions right. and so forth. So, for example, um, some people say that Camden, New Jersey is an example of defunding the police. Well, only in one sense, as I understand it, uh, Camden sort of decommissioned its police department so it could get out from under the union contract and instantly recreated a different police department with different rules. Uh, some same personnel, some different. They were able to hire a lot more policemen because they were able to pay them less because the union contract wasn't binding them. So that was maybe an instance of defunding the police, but it was more of a, maybe a necessary legal maneuver than it was actually defunding policing. I think the biggest issue for me, and I'll, I'll go back to my book, Race and Liberty in America, uh, it's an anthology, which makes the case that the people in the book, um, from Frederick Douglass to Ward Connolly today, and here it is. This is a great book. <laughs> yeah, in between people like Branch Rickey, who has got, got a great speech in there about how the classical liberal principles of civil rights, which included individual freedom, the Constitution as a colorblind document, um, Christianity or Judaism as a root uh, uh, source of our natural rights, 
Uh, capitalism is something that undermines racism. There are many examples in Race and Liberty in America how businesses um, had an incentive not to discriminate. Now, oftentimes the government forced them to do so. Um, in the 1960s, classical liberal principles seem to have triumphed with the Civil Rights Act of 1964. What happened with the riots is a turning point for this long classical liberal tradition because both Democrats and yes, the Nixon administration responded to the riots by increased social spending and developing affirmative action. It's actually Nixon that brings affirmative action. Yeah, people, Republicans forget that. Yeah, to America <laughs> permanently. I mean, Democrats, unions, AFL-CIO, uh, even the NAACP, they saw affirmative action as a step backward. Um, Nixon saw affirmative action as a way to split the Democratic Party. That's a cynical part of Richard Nixon. Um, but also as an, a response to the emergency situation of, of the riots. I mean, I guess in a sense, um, Robert Higgs in his book, Crisis and Leviathan, writes about uh, how crises uh, lead to expanded government. And certainly that was the case with the riots and the response of the Johnson and Nixon administrations. You know, what's, what I find troubling, sort of looking at it philosophically at that period, I find it troubling that both kinds of responses, that is to say, you know, draconian crackdown with uh, law enforcement and more on the one hand, and then quotas and affirmative action on the other hand, they both had the implication of uh, assuming the lack of agency almost a dehumanizing of the people whom they were either, on the one hand, squelching violently, or on the other hand, supporting um, artificially, um, it seemed to me to have a, a bad implication of, an, of an, a bad attitude toward the beneficiaries and the recipients of either the violence or the preferences. Whereas the classical- yeah. It brought back two things, okay. It brought back government classification by race, which the, the touchstone of classical liberal tradition of civil rights is this. Um, we are all one race. Frederick Douglass said that. Um, there's an interesting document in there that uh, he married a white woman. And the Washington Post interviewed him because people were critical. And he said, Frederick Douglass, a former slave, certainly not tone deaf to racism, that he's a member of the one race that God created. Um, others, you know, right through the 20th century, uh, they fought against racial classification. Now, under the Johnson and Nixon administrations, racial classification comes back in, and that's the basis for all sorts of programs to divide Americans uh, into... Uh, well, you know, many of them were well-intended, but they nevertheless, they, they ended up having the effects that their assumptions would have suggested, namely that kind of a dehumanizing effect. Uh, I've got a couple more questions that we want to fit in here before we have to stop. Um, one of our friends on the line named Chris uh, asked this question uh, for... John Bean, he says, might the short-lived Rodney King riots uh, have been cut short because certain minority business owners threatened armed resistance? Uh, um, I'm not sure that the Rodney King riots were, were necessarily cut short. There was a lot of armed resistance, um, most famously the Koreans, but it was not just Korean business owners uh, mm -hmm. in 1992. Uh, that became a, a controversy, you know, should they have the right to defend themselves? Um, in the 1960s, businesses that defended themselves with arms uh, sometimes escaped the looting and the rioting since the police weren't doing it for them. Um, mm -hmm. So, but it's a touchy issue for liberal democratic mayors. Um, in the 60s, the police and the city governments were urging business owners not to use guns. In 1992, the same thing. And some cities passed ordinances making it illegal to use a gun in a riot zone. Well, of course, that just worsens the situation. Man, I should think so, right. Oh, okay, another question uh, in our chat box uh, from a friend of ours named Terry, um, who says the attack on capitalism is being renewed. What roots do you see organizationally with this kind of relentless attack on capitalism? Um, are is that attack on capitalism intrinsically connected, I guess, is the question, intrinsically connected to these riots? Or is it something else? Can you, can you tell? Well, certainly there are some left-wing groups that are anti-capitalistic. Um, 
I, what I've seen is more people asking for, quote, a piece of the pie. That was mm -hmm. also the uh, slogan that was uh, circulated in the late 1960s, uh, that African Americans are poor. Um, you know, some groups blame that on capitalism. Uh, in, the, in the 1960s, there were people like that. You had people like J uh, James Foreman, prominent uh, black radical activist, who called for things like handing over ownership of a uh, certain number of Fortune 500 companies to, to Negroes, the word, the word for the day. Um, so there, wow. is that, there is that strain. <laughs> but again, if, if listeners go to my book, uh, Race and Liberty in America, uh, there are people like S.B. Fuller. He was a black business owner in the 60s, and he was adamantly opposed to um, more extreme forms of black radicalism. And uh, he had an interview, which I include in the book, I think in U.S. News and World Report, in which he talked about how, you know, if you're going to operate a business, you have to operate on, on the basis of green and, and treating your customers and your workers. Right. Not black or white. And he said the black business owners like himself, self, they have to watch out because there will be people in their organization that want to hire only blacks. And, but that's not good business. Yeah, so uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had a really interesting conversation here on the Lighthouse Briefing um, with Dr. David Beto, the author of a biography of T.R.M. Howard, who was an extraordinarily successful capitalist, uh, African-American businessman, civil rights leader. Um, it seems that there's quite a tradition, as you point out in your book, Race and Liberty in America, of black leaders going back to Frederick Douglass and many others who affirmed the essential components of the principled constitutionalism uh, grounded in uh, human rights, uh, equality, liberty, and the law, uh, and that that tradition has been the vehicle for the advancement of all people uh, more effectively than anything else, uh, regardless of their race. So I think with that, we do have to bring it to a close. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jonathan Veen, for being with us today. Thank you for your callers, for their questions. Yeah, they've been great. They, they always are. And let me thank everybody on the line. Thank you for joining us. Thank you from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California.